you guys love your brand, you guys love your, your business, and you're very um, passionate about it at this point. So do your due diligence before you launch. Welcome to this week's uh, Entrepreneurship 101, where we are uh, talking about IP, or intellectual property management, and this session is presented by Gilbert's LLP. And what's really great about this is this is their first time to Mars and to seeing Entrepreneurship 101, so thank you for coming and for supporting our program. Um, it's also a change of format for this lecture, so we have the added benefit of having three lawyers with uh, different sector and e expertise focuses. So I'll start on the far, I guess, right with Ashley uh, Fros. Ashley's a lawyer and trademark agent whose, whose practice encompasses um, <clears throat> trademarks, branding, and domain name laws. So she's worked with a number of, of different clients in a multitude of industries re with respect to managing and protecting their brands. She focuses on trademark and copyright prosecution and conducting trademark availability and register... I'm never going to be able to say that. Registrability. Registrability. Yeah, that's it. Searches. She also helps clients plan and execute um, brand protection strategy. So Ashley's very much um, a trademarks and branding expert. Next we have Nathaniel in the middle. Uh, Nathaniel's expertise is in a nutshell uh, for, for the life sciences people in the room. He's, he's in the life sciences industry, or, um, works with life sciences companies and also specialist in litigation. So he's a litigator, a Canadian patent and trademark agent and government relations consultant. He represents clients in court and before the Canadian and US governments. His practice involves assisting clients in civil and intellectual property litigation and policy matters with an emphasis on pharmaceutical issues including drug intellectual property, pricing and reimbursement, biologics and protection against counterfeit. He's represented software and energy companies, brand name and generic drug manufacturers and chemical suppliers in various aspects of patent proceedings in Canada. And our final panelist is Matthew Powell, and he is also a specialist in patents, but more in the ICT industry. So he leads the patent agency and industrial design agency practice groups at Gilbert's. He's a registered patent agent in Canada and the United States, and is also a professional engineer. He was awarded the Mary F. Morenci Memorial Prize by the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada, IPIC, for having earned the highest mark in patent drafting during his qualifying examination. That's great. He has since served on several IPIC committees, is now a fellow, fellow of the Institute, and was recently appointed by the Commissioner of Patents to the Patent Agent Examining Board for a term of three years. So we're, we're actually going to have, I think, Nathaniel starting? Yeah, I'm going to start off. They're each going to do a section, and then Nathaniel's going to wrap up, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So most people would not consider it an added benefit that you have three intellectual property lawyers instead of one, um, because one is probably more than enough to deal with for a long time. But the way we figured we'd do this is, is as a tag team, I would do a general overview of IP. Uh, Matt would start talking about patents, really give a need to know, and then Ashley would do the same for trademarks. There's a lot we could talk about about intellectual property in 45 minutes. What we're gonna try to do is just get you starting to think about the questions that you should be asking yourselves uh, in dealing with IP in your businesses. And so just by show of hands, how many people in the audience have a business that is based on some no concept that they view as novel? Something that they haven't seen before? So I, 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 I guess 20%, so a, good, a fair, fair number of you. Um, how many of you, when you're dealing with people and you want to protect that concept, use a non-disclosure agreement? Something that says, on pain of death, you will not disclose anything that I tell you for the, next, for the rest of our lives. A lot of you. And then uh, what I've seen is a lot of people will do that, but then they say, well, I'm not going to apply for intellectual property protection because I have this agreement and it's a strong agreement. And oftentimes these are really strong agreements. And so what I thought I'd do to start off is just tell a story about intellectual property theft. You can see on the slide, this is a man with a formula in his head and then a man in a hat running over, or a man, a robber running away with the thought bubble. Uh, we have a client, the client's an inventor. He's invented a product, but he's an inventor. He needs somebody with some business savvy to help him out to commercialize it. So he hires somebody as a business partner. And I can't say what the product is because it's not on the market right now, but let's just say it's a baby bottle and it has an inventive feature that it cleans itself, which would be really great for me. I have a four-month-old son. 
I could use this bottle. It would be very lucrative. And so he has, uh, he's, he's looking to commercialize, and he has his, this partner sign an, 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 a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA. It's a fantastic NDA. It protects him uh, six ways to Sunday. Uh, he does not file for a patent, and he does not file for a trademark. Why does he need to? He has this agreement. He's not sharing it with everybody. Uh, but what happens is the businessman and he and the businessman have a falling out, as scientists and business people sometimes do. And the businessman, with all of his contacts, goes and commercializes the product. This is happening right now. And so what do we do for him? Well, what's, what has he done with the product? He's made a slight change to the shape and the color of the product, just enough to say this is a completely different product. My product cleans the bottle completely different than yours, do different than yours does. And so uh, we, representing the inventor, have to go to court and say, you violated the non-disclosure agreement. The only problem is, do you know how much money it costs to enforce a non-disclosure agreement? It's going to cost over $100,000, almost certainly, if, and that's if it doesn't go all the way to a trial. And so what it taught me when, when I saw this happen, to say, wow, we have a guy, he invented something, he's in the right, but it's going to cost him a fortune, and he, all he needs is to get this product out there, and the other guy might beat him to the market. And so that's why it's that kind of situation that made us think, well, we need, to, we need people to learn more about, about intellectual property earlier in the process, why it's an important early investment. Not always, but there are things that our inventor may have been able to do to stop this situation from happening. And uh, you may not know, oh, obviously you don't, the inventor is Canadian, and he would not be, it, not be alone in being somebody who didn't get intellectual property protection for his invention. There was a study done by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office that found that only 20% of businesses that have some science or technology aspect to their business have any record of engaging with the Intellectual Property Office. That leaves 80% that never bothered. And compared to the US, we're, we're not capitalizing and getting reven earning revenues from our university invention. So our businesses aren't doing that well. Our universities aren't doing that well. And as a country, we are actually paying billions of dollars out to businesses in other countries for the rights to use their intellectual property. And so we all have a problem. And I think the first step is acknowledging the problem. But then education, how can we do better? And so that's what we're here to do for you today. Um, so what kinds of IP protection are there? It's a first basic question. What can I even get? So there's lots of different types, but we focus here on five today. Patent and trademark are often considered the most valuable, and uh, Ashley and Matt are going to dedicate their entire time to them. Uh, the other three that we thought are worth mentioning are uh, trade secrets, design, and copyright. Off, people often confuse them, and so if we're saying, how do we distinguish between these different types of rights? Copyright is anything that's written down or fixed. It's a, a, an original uh, expression of, of, uh, of some kind of idea. So a Mickey Mouse, or even the cartoon that, that I showed a couple slides ago um, over here, that would be copyright. I paid 12 bucks for that cartoon to get it in the presentation because somebody owned the copyright for it. Uh, a design is some kind of product may have a unique way appearance, like an iPhone or a pair of pants or a chair, and you can actually protect the design just by its appeal to the eye. It's completely separate from a trademark where you can get similar kinds of protection, completely separate from copyright or patent. And then a trade secret is basically anything that's valuable to your business that you're not sharing with anyone. The other kinds of, of, uh, of, pr of property are things that are available to the world, that they can see, they can see the product on the shelf, or, they, or they, they can see that you're advertising using a certain name. But um, a trade secret is something you don't share with anyone. It's the, it's the way that our inventor was treating his baby bottle. Um, another point before we launch into the, the guts of patents and trademarks is that IP is valuable. It is something that you hold on your balance sheet that you can buy and sell and trade in. And just by way of example, when Motorola and Nortel, uh, when their patents were sold, per patent they got over $700,000. And that's not five patents or six patents, that's thousands of patents. That's how much their patents were worth. Not every patent is worth that much money. A lot of patents are worth a lot more than that, a lot of patents are worth a lot less, but it's important to know that when you're 
when you're getting intellectual property protection, you are acquiring an asset that you can then use as you see fit, regardless of what else happens to your business. Coca-Cola is a trademark, and that trademark also has uh, a lot of value. So that's my intro. I want to launch into patents, and now Matt is going to go into really the need to know of patents. What are those things you want to know right now that you can take home with you? Thank you for having us uh, today. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to, to meet with inventors, and in fact, that's the work I do is, as a patent agent, I, folks come into my office or I go visit them at their factory or at their house sometimes and, and, and sit down with them and, and understand what they're trying to achieve and see if there's a way to protect it with patents. And so having a whole room full of you folks is, uh, is, is great. It's, it's like uh, a bit of a drug for me. It's very interesting stuff. Um, a patent you may have read stuff that a patent gives you an exclusive right to you know, practice an invention, these kind of things, but a patent really gives its owner some control over how an advantage produced by an invention is, is, it reaches the customer. And so going back to the patent as an asset, when you, when you add that asset to your balance sheet, you're adding control to your business. And there are a couple of ways to exercise control. There's a couple of ways in general. There's the classical strategy, which is to stop a competitor altogether from copying your invention. And sometimes that means that the competitor can't produce the advantage that the consumer wants. Um, another way is to force that competitor to design around what you are protecting in your patent. And again, that takes the competitor more time, more money, and it creates a competitive advantage for you. Those are classical ways of making use of patents. The cooperative way I like to call it of making use of patents is the licensing model. Now sometimes you don't always want to license your invention. What you often find if you're producing an end consumer product or if you're producing something that you're going to control uh, production and all the things down the line, you might want to use the classical model of, of patent enforcement or patent uh, control. But if you are uh, producing software, uh, the kinds of inventions that will be used with a platform technology, often you want to th start thinking about the cooperative model because, for example, if you have a, and uh, you'll see an example in a couple of slides, if you've developed a way, a piece of software that allows for a small keyboard on a, on a smartphone, for if you hit two keys with one thumb, and you've developed software that arbitrates between which key you actually should have hit and the one that it should discard for displaying, then are you, in order to get that advantage to the consumer, you have to ask yourself, am I going to reproduce the entire smartphone? And the answer is probably not, uh, or you'll be competing head to head with, with the big guys. Maybe it is, but the other way is to approach the big guys and say, listen, I got this super technology, I've got it patented, I think you should roll it into your product. And that's a cooperative model because they win and you win. So. Uh, with that in mind, you, you, you often want to ask yourself, have, is what I've got patentable? And I've got up here the official definition in the Canadian Patent Act, which is the statute in Canada that covers patents, and it's very similar to the United States, of what defines an invention. Uh, an invention has to be new, useful, and non-obvious. And non-obvious is really the key to what an invention is versus just a minor change from something else. So if you took some kind of prior product and changed its color, that would not be a non-obvious change. That would be an obvious change, and so it wouldn't be an invention. So the other thing is there are certain categories of invention. You've got machines, manufacturers, composition of matter. These are things that, that can be held in your hand often or experienced. There are other things, art and a process, that might apply something like a method of manufacturing your product. And you can get patents on methods of manufacturing their product because they may be very useful to you for speeding up production or dropping uh, price of, uh, per unit down m drastically. And if you have that protection, you have a massive competitive advantage. So I have a couple of examples of, and I talked about the, the, the thumb key arbitration version, but on, on the left side of this slide I have things that would, would be considered patentable, and I've kind of kept the first three in the software space. And on the right side, 
I've talked, just to give a bit of contrast, the kinds of things you don't really use patents to protect. So at the, you know, the first one is in a digital camera, you might have an algorithm that looks at a digital image and sharpens it up because the, the, the person taking the camera, the taking the picture, the photographer is uh, unsteady hand and my wife hates me for that because I always take blurry photos and actually I haven't figured out what the button is to sharpen it up, but that's my problem and not yours. That kind of thing may be patentable. However, the actual digital image is not something you would protect with a patent. It's something you would have copyright on if you were the one producing that photo photograph. The second one, again, a process for arbitrating between keystrokes. Again, a software invention meant for smartphones where you have small keys. That kind of thing is patentable. But if you were talking about a look of an icon displayed on a screen, that goes to copyright, trademark, industrial design kind of area. Um, I've got a couple of other examples there. Uh, the next one is, for example, and I get asked about this a lot, is, is digital media something you get a patent on? The digital media player, or a, uh, or a, or a particular method that a, that a digital player would use to say buffer digital media or allow you playback front and back, that kind of thing, might be patentable. But the actual digital media running through a full length feature film, that itself would be a copyright thing. And uh, just for fun, I was sitting on my desk and I had a bottle of hand sanitizer. Sometimes the, sometimes the formulation uh, can be patented, but the bottle in which it's uh, sitting is the kind of thing that you, unless the bottle works in a novel way, you wouldn't get a patent on that bottle. You might get an industrial design protection on that bottle because it might look cool. It might really draw the consumer's attention in a store. Now, when I meet with inventors, one of the first things I ask them is, tell me about what you've done with your idea. Have you been talking to people about it? And the reason I ask that is because patent laws are really strict about prior disclosure of the invention. And there's been a lot of talk already tonight about non-disclosure agreements. Those are very useful. You don't want to be disclosing your invention to the public in general. For example, I wouldn't want to be standing up here disclosing one of my client's inventions to you because that can harm your ability to secure patent protection. Now, it's not only disclosure of the invention, it's use of the invention in certain ways. That if you do that, if you use the invention outside of experimental use or producing a prototype and figuring out how the thing works, if you use it in a commercial sense, that may stop you from being able to get a patent. And also if you sell or offer to sell the invention itself. So, so the good rule of thumb is if you've got something and you're feeling the urgency to get it out on the market or to start trying it out, talk to an IP guy or gal and ask, can I do this thing? Can I do this disclosure? Can I do this sale? Can I talk to these people? What should I do? And the advice may be, well, let's, let's hurry up and put something together so we can file a provisional patent application or something like that. And later we can talk about what it means to file a provisional application, maybe in questions if you'd like. So we always like to, uh, we always like to suggest that the best kind of protection, the best kind of thing is to get your stake in the ground first with a fat patent filing, and then you can start to really disclose and use. Now, the process of preparing a patent, uh, I'll tell you a bit about maybe why patents are granted by governments. The idea with a patent is to not so much encourage invention, but to encourage disclosure of the invention. So you'll have a patent and it actually becomes a public document. So what you put in that patent and what you describe in your invent about your invention will eventually become something that the whole world will see. Now, the, the idea is you the, the government produces a patent system, like patent laws and the various rules and procedures and the examining systems that encourage or draw out of you your invention so that you can disclose it to the public. But in return, you get that exclusive right. You get that control, as I referred to before. And so the bar, it's, it's, like you're, it's like you're striking a bargain with the public. You're saying, hey, if the public can give me an exclusive right, I'll give them my invention. The idea is they'll learn from my stuff, but I'll get to be able to stop people from doing a certain aspect of what I've done or control that aspect, and that's very good. So a patent document is kind of framed that way. The actual patent is two, two parts. The first part is 
a full description of an invention. So you'll go into how to make the invention, how to use it, some variations on it. You might have some diagrams, flow charts, maybe some pictures, that kind of thing. The second part of the patent is the patent claims. Now the patent claims, each claim is a sentence. And the sentence really defines in words the exclusive right or the control you're going to be able to exercise by stopping someone else or forcing them to license later. And that's, that's the teeth of the patent. So when you're preparing a patent application, you're doing those two things. You're preparing this full disclosure and you're preparing the teeth. So what you do with that is you put that together and often if you're working with a patent agent, uh, you'll work on sort of what's best for your business and what kind of patent claim you'd like to have, whether it be a method patent claim or whether it covered just an apparatus or some other more creative ways to protect the invention. And then you'll take that document once everybody agrees, once the inventor is very happy with it, and you'll file it at a patent office. Now you could file it at all patent offices around the world today, and I should just preface that by saying that patents are granted only in a country. So there's a Canadian patent, there's a United States patent. They're two different things, two different systems. They may have the same text, the same description, the same claims even, but they're governed by two different patent systems. And so when you file your application, you could file in Canada, US, if you're interested in Europe, Japan, these kinds of places, immediately you could do that today. But it adds up, it gets very costly. Fortunately, there's some really interesting ways that you can defer a lot of those fees and still get the kind of protection you're looking for, the kind of control you're looking for in all those countries. The first way is to take advantage of international convention. And what essentially that does, there's an, there's an agreement be, between a vast number of countries' patent systems where you can file in one country today and wait up to 12 months before you file in any of those other countries. When you do file in those countries, you just let those patent offices know that you're linking those applications back to that first filing. So you get your stake in the ground, you file these ones 12 months later, and they're treated as though they were filed on your first day. But you only had to pay for the filings 12 months later. Now, going back to disclosure issues, just before you run off and do that, if you've disclosed the invention, that changes that landscape a little bit. But presuming that you hadn't disclosed the invention or put it on use and that kind of thing, that's a neat system for using. There's also another neat system called the Patent Cooperation Treaty, and that is what you might have referred to, uh, heard of referred to as a international application. The Patent Cooperation Treaty allows you to file one patent application, and when you do that, you secure over 140 options to later file in other countries and have those filings treated as though they were filed when you filed the PCT application. And that later filing is up to 30 months, which can be incredibly useful. If you're talking to investors, they like to hear that you've got those options available because they may be very interested in pursuing a Chinese patent because they may be very interested in pursuing a Chinese business. But at the same time, you didn't have to pay for that Chinese patent later and you didn't have to even decide whether you wanted to go into China until about the 30 month time comes. That can be a really powerful tool and very useful to use. Once you've filed your patent application, I'm just going to talk country specific, there's a bit of a negotiation with a patent examiner. The patent examiner's job is to look at your application and make sure it complies with the country's laws. So what the patent examiner will do is look at your patent application, your disclosure, and your claims, your drawings, get an understanding of what's going on, and then do a search. And they're very adept at searching. They'll search not just previous patents, but they'll search IEEE databases. They'll search, depends on what the technology is, but they'll have access to all those databases. And they'll produce an examiner's report that they send back to you. And what the examiner's report includes is often some kind of rejection or objection to how you framed your application. So when we're, when we're originally drafting these claims, based on what we know, we like to draft them nice and broad because there's no reason to draft them so narrow, usually. You draft them nice and broad, the examiner gets that, does examination on it, says, hey, that's a little too broad for me, you need to adjust things. Well, that's okay, we can adjust down from there, but it's hard to adjust up. So what, what this is in effect is, in each patent office, a bit of a negotiation with the patent examiner. Once you get through that process, and the examiner's happy that 
the application as amended meets their laws, uh, or meets their requirements for patentability, they will issue a notice of allowance, you'll pay a small fee, and you'll get your granted patent. And at that point, you can use the teeth to bite someone if you need to, or to exercise control, as they say. So that happens in each country, and uh, it can take a while, but there are ways to, uh, and they've, they've come out in the past three or four years, wonderful ways to, if you're making good progress in one patent office, to leverage that process to speed up examination in another patent office. And we can talk about that a little bit if you're interested as well, or anybody can give me a call and, and ask, ask how that works. Now, sometimes you have something you've come up with, and it could be an invention, but you want to keep it secret. Well, Nathaniel touched a little bit on keeping an invention secret, and there are some very good things about it, and there are appropriate times to use that, and there are some things that you should be aware of if you choose to keep it secret. Now, with a patent, as I said, in 18 months after you file it, in all countries, it's going to become a public document. That's whether you get a patent or not. The patent examiner may be not interested in giving you a patent on such a broad thing, and you may have quite a negotiation. But in the meantime, that thing has been published. So that's something you've got to be aware of if you know, you're thinking, maybe I should have kept it secret. Well, it's too late at that point. On the other hand, you can keep a trade secret secret as long as you are able to keep it close to your vest. You know, keep the employee agreements, keep the non-disclosure agreements really well organized. It takes a lot of effort, but that can be done. The other thing with the patent is it's a public document and you're able to stop others or control, you know, as I said, the, the, you can exercise your control you know, if someone comes up with the invention independently after you. You're able to exercise the control against them. But with a trade secret, because you've kept it in-house and someone else comes up with it completely independently, they're free to use it. You don't have any way to stop them. That's different from if one of your employees under the non-disclosure agreement leaves. You're able to sue them under the non-disclosure agreement. But if some other company just comes up with it as they go, you don't have a, any, any mechanism or hook to stop them from doing that. So what you want to think about when you're looking at what do I have and is it appropriate for patent or trade secret or these kinds of things is, is it the kind of invention that you can't even fathom anybody else reproducing or uh, reverse engineering? And the classical example given often is uh, the Coca-Cola recipe. I don't think that's public knowledge. Uh, it's a trade secret of Coca-Cola. They've kept it for a long time. And you could, get a, you could get a bottle of Coke and you could run it through chemical analysis and this sort of stuff. And you're still pretty, pretty hard to get to what they're actually doing in the factory. And they're happy with that. As Ashley will talk about, Coca-Cola is a major branding play and not so much a formula play. But I like Coke and might as well plug it. Um, whereas uh, other kinds of inventions where if you took the product in the end and you could open it up and you could say, oh, I see what they did. Oh, okay, that's really cool, I'm going to do that. That's the kind of thing that you probably want to look at patenting because you wouldn't be able to keep it a trade secret. It's, it's so easy to reverse engineer. It may be very powerful, but it's easy to reverse engineer. So uh, I think that was my last slide. And, uh, of course, we're going to have questions afterwards, and I'm quite happy to take phone calls and whatever you want if you have a question. But I'll pass it on to Ashley to give us a branding angle. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so what I care about, and I get very excited about branding. When you're commercializing your product or your services, taking it to the market, how attractive can you make it to the consumer? Fundamental foundation of the brand is trademarks, and I love trademarks law. Uh, the trademark to me is not just a little logo or name of, a, of your company. It's a lot more powerful than that. The trademark represents the reputation and the quality and the expertise of your company and your products and your services. And it can be very powerful. There's an unspoken dialogue between the consumer and your company through that trademark. So an example I use is if you take a sneaker or a trainer. I grew up in England. I call them sneakers. Sorry. Uh, running, shoe. running shoe. And it's unbranded. Retail value, maybe $50 something like that. I'm not very sporty, so I don't know that either. Then you take that same sneaker, you slap on a Nike swoosh, 
retail value goes up to about $150. Could be that it's more engineered. Maybe it's not that much different. But the power of that brand means that wherever that brand is going, there is a mass of consumers base that's following it. So that can be a very significant tool, a business asset for you companies as you're building up your company and going into the marketplace. Okay, so some people have the assumption of just a trademark is just the name and that's it and they don't want to go any further into that. That's, that's not true at all. And my perspective when I'm helping companies protect their brand is that as creative as you have been in creating your company and its products and its services and inventing something, you should be as equally creative in marketing it. So what can be a trademark, I've used pretty uh, standard trademarks there. Uh, single words, group of numbers, group of, uh, group of words, slogan, design without words, design with words. What really gets my mojo going is when I get into the non-traditional trademark area. And that's basically, as long as it's somewhat unique and it's distinctive and it shows to the consumer that this is a product or service that is from your company and there's a direct line, it's very possible that whatever that marketing tool is, that branding tool is, it could in fact be a trademark. It could fall under a trademark. Three-dimensional designs, the tags on purses, for example. Colors, um, for example, the UPS uh, uniform is all in brown or a delivery service van, the coloring, distinct coloring on the delivery service van for services, that could be a trademark in itself. A distinguishing guise is the shaping uh, of the product or the packaging itself, or a sound trademark. Now this is very revolutionary for Canada where um, this only came into, into uh, work, or came to be recognized by the Canadian Trademarks Office this year, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer uh, put up a big struggle for about 12 years to try and make sure that whenever you go to the movies and you hear a roaring lion, that you would know that that is a movie that is created by them. Um, so sound trademarks can be, uh, can be also very useful as well. And what I like to use as an example of how intellectual property and smart branding and, and Considering intellectual property to be a tool to help you, a business asset tool to help you differentiate yourself in the market through patents or, or through trademarks is the Nesquik chocolate syrup bunny bottle. So in this situation, remember I told about distinguishing guys as the distinct shaping or packaging of a product. Well, who loves chocolate syrup? Children. Who loves bunnies? Children. This company was able to get a branding monopoly over the shaping of a product that directly relates to and is attractive to the consumer. And now they're at a higher advantage from the marketing perspective that they have exclusivity over that. And really that's what intellectual property does. It creates exclusivity for you. So it can be a very, very powerful tool. So not every trademark is created equal, and I've had many a time entrepreneurs have come to me and they just think, oh, we have the patents and the trademarks isn't as big of a deal. But when you're in the marketplace in all of these different countries and you haven't done your due diligence and you haven't really invested your, uh, your time and creativity into creating a very unique and distinctive brand, you can run into problems. So not every trademark is created equal. Um, and, and this, is, this is why. So generic trademarks, you cannot trademark the name of a product as, as the product. So you can't have Apple to sell apples or apple juice. Apple to sell computers is different. You cannot trademark uh, anything that is descriptive of the product or services because the overlying concern is that you don't want to give one company a monopoly over branding of that product through describing it. But as we've seen with Pizza Pizza, the beer store, there are exceptions to this and this is when you've acquired distinctiveness um, because you've used the trademark so well and for such a long period of time and because that unspoken dialogue has been cemented into the mass consumer's mind that sometimes it can be trademarked. But generally, when you're starting off as an entrepreneur, 
where personally I would like you to be, is at the coined terms, in the coined area. That's a made up name. So an example would be, I don't know, 50 years ago, would anyone have assumed that Xerox had anything to do with a photocopying company? Probably not. Now let's say, hypothetically, that Xerox came along 50 years ago, and now a photocopy uh, paper supplier came along a year after that called Xerum. Well, that's a little bit too convenient for that to be coincidence. It's likely that Xerum would be trying to trade off of the goodwill of Xerox. So from a litigation standpoint, I think Nathaniel will agree, the more distinctive and coined you are, the easier it is down the road for us to help protect your brand. Because, don't get it twisted, the more successful you are, the more people want to cachet in on your brand. We, we see that all the time. And there's nothing more unfortunate, it makes me cringe, when an entrepreneur comes to me, hasn't done their due diligence, hasn't really thought about it, and two years after they're at the marketplace, they say, oh, I got a demand letter from this multinational company. Well, do you want to fight this? Do you have the resources to do it? If you haven't really you know, gone international, do you maybe just want to look at tweaking your brand? And it killed because you guys love your brand. You guys love your, your business, and you're very um, passionate about it at this point. So that's something to definitely consider, is doing your due diligence ahead of time. Not everything can be trademarked. Um, and look at the marketplace. What's out there? Is it similar? Are you going to run into issues? If you know that you want to go into Canada and also the US, and probably you think that there's a good market in Europe, well, it makes sense to see if you have a viable brand before you actually go in there. So that's a good tip from me to you, if I do say so myself. So the best way to protect a brand is I'm going to say obtain a trademark registration. Now, you don't have to. I'm not a lawyer that's going to tell you you have to do this and you have to do that. There are common law trademark rights, which basically means if you're starting to use it, you accrue rights. It's not the best way to do it. And I prefer that my, my, uh, my clients be uh, business savvy and not business stupid. So I think that obtaining trademark registration is the best way to go about it. If you have investors that are interested in you, it shows that you actually have a business asset because it's formalized protection. As such, it increases the value of your company. It's evidence of ownership. So in the kerfuffle that Nathaniel and I are involved in now with the, um, it wasn't a baby bottle thing, but we're labeling it as that. Um, if, if he or she had protected their trademarks and their patents ahead of time, it definitely would have bolstered their position from a litigation standpoint. Um, it gives you exclusivity, often countrywide, uh, which is definitely beneficial. And this is a little uh, feather in the cap for trademarks people, is that IP is the only kind of intellectual, or trademarks is the only kind of IP that's renewable indefinitely forever. There's certain you know, footnotes to that, as long as you're continuing to use it and properly, et cetera. But every other type of trademark apart from, or every type of IP apart from trade secrets uh, has a finite period of protection. So trademarks can go with you for forever. Um, and it can be a springboard for international protection um, throughout. Again, similar to patents, it's, trademarks is protected country by country. Um, and it definitely can assist you um, with that. Another interesting avenue is that if you start to get into the social media side of, of, of your brand, regardless of whether or not your service industry or business to consumer or business to business, is that trademark protection can definitely be a very significant tool in assisting you dealing with domain name disputes, social media disputes, et cetera, et cetera. So one tip that I can give to you, so the first is think about it seriously and be creative in protecting your brand. Not every trademark is, is uh, created equal. So do your due diligence before you launch it because it would be unfortunate for you to then have to relaunch again. And the third is, regardless of whether or not you get a trademark registration, the work doesn't end there. The trademark, your brand, it's a living brand. It changes with you as your company grows, as it goes into different areas of, of the industry, as it takes on a life of its own. Um, it can go with slogans. The, as your packaging becomes a little bit more sophisticated, as you move into the online space. So don't forget to always keep your pulse on what's happening with your brand. And even if you get to the point where 
you're tired of doing everything yourself and you're able to now bring in a finance person and bring in a marketing consultant. Make sure you know what's going on so that your IP portfolio, your brand portfolio, your business asset portfolio essentially is, is in line with what's happening with the brand. Use is a critical term, uh, in, in, especially in Canada and the States, because trademark rights are acquired through use and maintained through use. So if you see, I've used use in three different ways, um, and it's to make sure that, that you become aware, and I can't get into the whole use thing, because I only had 10 to 15 minutes, um, but just because you have a registration, you need to always consistently use it, use it as you've registered it, make sure that if the way that you're using it changes, that you've updated the registrations and, and updated your portfolio. If you're licensing it out, um, with your trademark out, your brand and your products out, that's fantastic, but again, now somebody else is using the brand, and that could possibly invalidate your brand rights. Um, so constantly do audits of what's going on annually, I think, would be uh, appropriate. So here's a pretty interesting uh, example of, 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 of what I'm talking about. Does anyone know what the three on the left have in common versus the four on the right? And somebody has to answer, even if it's wrong. Yes. I actually can't see. Someone just speak up. Correct, exactly. But the ones on the left actually used to be trademarks. So you remember how I talked about, or Nathaniel talked about how Coca-Cola brand was so valuable? Well, Escalator branded Smoothing Staircase. A zipper branded, I forget the actual name because it's become so common now, I don't even know what it would be. Plasticine branded uh, molding clay. So these are examples of how they got a registration and they got their trademarks and they had their brand but they didn't keep up on it, and they didn't use it properly and police it properly and treat it as a living brand that had new challenges as the company uh, excelled. And that's the issue that they ran into. Now it's just a dictionary-defined term. So you can't talk about branding without talking about the social media, the online branding component on it. I'm not going to go through all of this, but basically we all know this, that there's a lot of stuff going on online. You cannot avoid it at all, even if you're in a business-to-business -business, uh, standpoint. The assumption with the online community of the online consumer is that the brand owner owns these different variations, the brand.com, the Twitter media handle, or the Twitter handle, the Facebook handle. The problem is that if you go online, if you don't go online, and you don't at least vacuum it up and be proactive in, in reserving your space online, somebody else will do it. It could be a valid company that just happens to be using a similar brand as you. Uh, Dove is owned by Mars Canada and Unilever Canada. They just happen to come up with the same name. Or it could be that somebody likes what you've got going on and they know that there's gonna be a lot of online traffic and they wanna profit off that over either through cyber squatting or typo squatting. So you need to make sure that you're up and savvy on what's happening online. And if you're not comfortable with it yet, at least be proactive and vacuum it up so other people can use it uh, instead of you. So that's a very, nut, like very nuts and bolts. And it's just to at least get you to think about this whilst you're in the sort of planning stages of your business. I really love your trademarks. I do. <laughs> I really do. Um, okay, so just to finish off, uh, we we're just going to do go through a few practical things that you can do if you're starting out as you're moving on with your business, uh, whatever the kind of IP that, that will help you get ahead of the game, and then just go through a couple of examples of interesting uses of IP. Uh, we tried to focus on things that you may not have thought of. So first we thought, um, good housekeeping. What can you do to maximize the value of your, your, the IP in your business? And so first, know what it is. It's unbelievable. People talk about their IP like they actually know what they're talking about. And they have this idea in their head, but you ask them five, 10 questions, and they just keep talking, but they can't actually isolate what it is they say they own. And so one of the exercises we like to go through is actually just define it. In a patent, you can define what your invention is. But sometimes, uh, for a trade secret, we had a company that they had a mentoring business where they had better success 
men with mentoring in businesses than anybody else. You can't patent that, but if you can define what you do that's so special and you can put it in a register, then if you're ever trying to do business or sell your business or explain what people can't share if you have a con an NDA, then you, you can at least define it and you can value it. And so know what it is, that's step one. And one of the things we've done, and Matt and Ashley, thanks for doing this, is uh, on the outside in the sign-up sheet, we tried to create a really, really simple list of questions you can ask yourself about uh, something you may want to patent or trademark. That if you're in the ballpark of um, answers that sound good to those questions, then, and you hand over your sheet, or if you uh, read your answers to some patent or trademark agent or a lawyer, then you're giving the inf them the information that they need to know. And so just try to figure out what it is that you think that you have that's so valuable and put it in words. Two is ensuring ownership of the IP. If you're an employee in a business or you own a business, it might not always be clear who owns what. If somebody um, had an, an engineer had an idea uh, and it was unusual but, and they'd never invented anything before, then who owns that? Well, the law in our country and lots of other countries is really friendly to people who invent stuff. And it's not so friendly to the companies that employ them, unless there's a contract. And so as a company, you should define at the outset exactly who's going to own what comes about in your business. If you don't do that, you're asking for a hassle. And we have a lot of issues in our, in our office of people who either want to start selling something and they can't because sure they're not sure if they're allowed, or lawsuits over who owns what. Uh, and then lastly is don't just do this at the outset. At the, at the startup stage of a company, you're so furiously trying to get things done, IP is so easy to put off. If you can, try not to put it off. Try to do these, these, these three things of just defining it, ensuring that you know who owns it, and then making sure as you go, you're just keeping up to date. Next is, a lot of people think that if you see that somebody else owns the IP or a patent or a trademark, that's it. Better find something else. And sometimes that's true. But there are hurdles and there are barriers. And it's important to know when you're dealing with a hurdle and when you're dealing with a barrier. If you're dealing with, um, a, if, you're, if you're about to start a business and you say, oh, somebody owns a patent that I need to, need to, to uh, develop my product, Maybe you can license that. Maybe you don't need to, uh, maybe you don't need to avoid it. And some people say, oh, I, I, my business won't work. Well, if you're at the early stages, if somebody owns a patent, how do they make money off that patent? It's by getting people to use it. And if you're one of the people who might use it, and then, then you partner with them. And then they end up being somebody who you, who's helped you and not somebody who stopped you. And then, uh, and then uh, suppose that there's a, a trademark where you, where you say, oh, somebody has the same words protecting their brand that I want to use. I can't use it. Well, wait a second. Maybe, and Ashley and I have talked about this in several instances, <coughs> you can say, well, you can use the words for products like this, but I can use them for products like that. And you enter an, an agreement to coexist, and you can revisit it over time. <coughs> or, and, and so. These things that you say, oh, I'm in trouble, well, maybe it's an opportunity to avoid trouble down the line. And if you figure these things out early when you're not in a bind, when you're not about to go to market and somebody sees that they have you, uh, then you can actually get, the, get rights that you may not, never have been able to get if you didn't act early. And in really tough situations, maybe there's somebody who's really difficult they own a patent that you, that, that, that you really need to use and they don't want to sell it to you. Maybe it's not a valid patent. Maybe they did something wrong when they filed it. Maybe it's not sufficiently inventive over something that existed beforehand. And maybe there are ways to get rid of that patent. And so you need to figure out, what can I, can I overcome? And what, sh what should make me pack up my bag and go home? A couple of examples that are just interesting because they're new ways of using IP. So Apple and Samsung, Apple just got a, a judgment against Samsung for a billion dollars in a US court because they, because they um, were said to have copied certain features, some, re, re, some patents, some industrial designs. And I have like pictures, they're hard to see, but um, on the left-hand side, you see the bounce back feature. Uh, when, you, when you click on the iPhone, and it bounces back when you've hit the bottom. In the middle is just the look of it, the look of the phone and how it maps onto Apple's 
That's the Samsung Galaxy mapping onto Apple's design patents. And then even the icon of how something looks, uh, they were able to get protection on because of its distinctiveness. And what's interesting is, Apple has been asserting these rights against everybody. If Apple never sold another iPhone or iPad, they would still probably make more money than Samsung, than HTC, than, than Microsoft, because of the fees they're getting from their patents. And the reason for that is, they patent the interface between the user experience and the hardware. Samsung has patents too, but a lot of their patents relate to the fundamental stand wireless standards, things that they've been forced to license at a very nominal fee. And so these, this is an interesting example of where companies are battling it out over who's going to own this technology, but maybe they may, they're going to make tons of money on their products, but they're also going to make tons of money just on the fact that they've licensed the IP to other companies. And so, I mean, obviously that's the outlier example. One that I thought was really interesting that I'd share before we finish up, it's I think the last slide, uh, maybe second last, is Gilead. It's a drug company. They make antiretrovirals, and they're extremely successful. They sell their products for market prices in the developed world, but they were having trouble selling in the developing world. And they found they couldn't break into least developed countries. They didn't have a distribution infrastructure. It wasn't profitable to. And they, their numbers were abysmal. They were selling, a, they could only reach 1,000 patients. I think it was in 2003. So what did they do? They said, well, let's license our IP to people who do know how to sell in these countries. And if they can reach, if they can penetrate the market in a deep way, they can make us more money at mu with much lower prices than we could ever hope to make. They literally are now at 3 million people taking a drug on a license from Gilead from all kinds of different companies, and those companies are competing with each other, driving the price down. They just have to pay 15% off the top to Gilead. And so that is a, a way where, this is a company that's able to leverage IP. If you do the calculation, it's many millions of dollars, but it's a creative way of using IP that does real good in the world. So I'll leave you guys with that, creative ways of using IP. We really do hope that you have some questions that we can try and help with, and thanks for taking the time. Thank you. I think um, there's yeah, microphones. Okay. There are microphones just up in the aisles here, and uh, maybe while we're waiting, I'll take one from the webcast. Um, this is coming from Craig. So there's been a lot of a lot of writing and thinking about um, lean startup and getting your minimal minimum viable product out there to test it in the market, um, which sort of conflicts with the idea of an NDA and patenting uh, before talking about your idea. So how would you advise on this theory? Well, um, I'm, I'm a little bit new to lean, lean startup, so I should show up at that, that uh, seminar. But I think the, the idea, at least with patenting, is that uh, Really, nothing can beat getting to the market first in very many instances. You're first, your brand is there first, you've got the product there first, so who cares about a patent? That might be a way to operate your business, particularly in a social networking space where you've got something that you're doing unique uh, in that space. You get to the market first, you get the eyeballs on your stuff, and then, and then you can go from there. The, the patent, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more costly, but that can allow you to uh, uh, maintain your competitive advantage later, but but it is probably no substitute for hitting that market first if you can, um, and that probably goes for uh, that. And that's that's right there with the branding and trademark cross section. I think what's important is just that you turn your mind to it. If you say your piece about IP before doing it, and you've at least done your diligence, then you can say this was my strategy and and I judged it to be the right commercialization strategy because I don't think the IP I can get is gonna be more valuable than that strategy. If you close your mind to IP and then just say, oh, I need to get the minimum viable product out in the marketplace, you may be foregoing some benefit down the line. You may also, though, be able to patent things that you do down the line. So you may be able to have the best of both worlds. In terms of uh, trademarks and brand protection, what's great is that you can file an application, a trademark application, based on proposed use. 
So even if you haven't launched a mar onto the marketplace, at least you can try and secure your, your trademark rights before you do. So when you really ramp up, you know, you're always already going to have some kind of protection. Now, in the U.S. and Canada, you're not going to have trademark registrations until you've launched it, but it can definitely be a tool to, to sort of get your foot in the door from the brand protection standpoint. <coughs> One from this side here. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the informative uh, session. I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, a couple of things. The business methods patents and the argument that the enforcement of software patents lately are hindering innovation instead of, you know, helping us innovate more, uh, particularly in the use of companies like patent trolls that are sitting on tens if not thousands of patents that are not used, but they just use to enforce to you know, make money of that. What do you think? And is this healthy overall, or where is it hiding? I, I don't know if it's healthy. If, if you're a company that is, is sitting and waiting for someone else to infringe, and when you could be spending time and effort trying to, trying to hit the market with something, that's probably the best thing. It's almost like a moral discussion a little bit. Um, they, the, the patent right allows you to exercise control whether or not you are act, actually practicing uh, what's, what's claimed in the patent. Um, there's a lot of hybrid there. There are R&D organizations that produce solutions to big problems but don't have a manufacturing wing and aren't interested in investing in that and pulling that out. They really just want to solve these problems. And their goal is to proactively get out there and make sure that those problems are being put into, or those solutions are being put into practice by practicing companies. So those would be called, uh, and you've heard of the term troll, There's, they would be called non-practicing entities. And that means they don't actually produce the product, but they produce the solutions that go into the products. And that's, I would say that's a very valid business model and a useful one. In terms of uh, uh, software patents and uh, there's been a lot of, you've seen a lot of stuff, the smartphone wars, it's in the Globe and Mail all the time, and, and this kind of thing. I think one way of looking at that is it hampers innovation. The other way of looking at that is um, everybody who has a patent has a seat at that table now. And as long as it's a con contribution to that end product, then don't they have the right to have that seat at the table? And I think that goes for any, any company. Now, the problem with some software patents is, and I talked a little bit about the examination process, when it gets to the patent examiner, they've got limited resources. They, they have access to databases to look up prior art and see what existed as of the date you filed your patent application, and they can do a lot of work there. But there is so much software that has been produced, so much open source that has been produced that the examiner themselves don't have easy access to. So sometimes, and actually more than sometimes, Patents will be granted for something that's not truly novel or inventive in view of what had already been done. And this makes software developers crazy because they know what's going on, it's just the patent office doesn't. So you get it what's effectively an invalid patent granted. And there are ways to knock that out, but it takes some effort. So that is a bit of a practical problem, but I don't think that we would throw the baby out with the bathwater on that necessarily. I like the seat at the table for an entrepreneur who wants to create something. So, uh, did, I, did I answer that okay? Uh, uh, kind of, yeah. I think business methods patterns is also something that's overly used for non-implemented patterns. So if you come up with an idea, for example, to, I think I've seen one for using a laser pointer to entertain a cat, right. and that is actually a patent. <laughs> yeah. So how could that have come into you know, effect? I don't know. It's a funny one. There are some outliers. Uh, there's that one. There's a method of swinging on a swing that someone patented. <laughs> They're comical. Uh, practically speaking, no one's going to run around and enforce those ones. But they were probably uh, thought experiments, uh, well, more than thought experiments, but experiments by patent attorneys who wanted, who, who wanted to publicize that there are problems with examination of patents and do it in a pretty dramatic way. So you literally, you're right, it's a laser pointer. This is how I'm going to exercise my cat, and that's in the patent claim. Uh, or method of swinging on the swing, and it's interesting, I talked about the two sides of the patents, they describe the inventor is the son of a patent attorney. So a young, a young boy invented this method of swinging on a swing where he sort of makes himself go in a bit of a, a loop. It's silly. They're never going to enforce it, but the, the patent attorney wanted to say, listen, I can get this by a patent examiner, because where is he going to search for this, where is he going to find this? 
Is he going to search in the data to find a movie where that happened? Like, where is he going to find this? So it, it really illustrated a practical problem with that. But I do feel those are outliers. Business method patents are often talked about when you're talking about, um, well, software is, is, they really overlap quite a bit with business method patents. And in Canada, um, we saw that Amazon.com was able to get their patent on their one-click um, <coughs> method of uh, buying a product. And that you know, made people crazy. But what you actually see in the patent claim is actually the, 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 the pieces that go together under the hood to make that happen. So they're not just covering click on a mouse and buy a product. They're covering a mechanism that achieves that, and a particular one that could probably be designed around. And so there was a lot of to do about whether that was a business method or whether that was actually a t an underlying technical method to achieve a business result. And so there's a distinction there. Let's take one from the right-hand side. Yeah, hi. Uh, I had a question. Uh, how enforceable are software patents, especially if a unique algorithm is sort of at the heart of it, but you've kind of uh, framed it in terms of a process being done on a hardware machine or something like that? Um, uh, secondly, related to that, um, uh, what, is, what is the opinion of or your experience on people who or companies who patent things uh, partly for the marketing value of saying our product is patented? Um, and thirdly, was related to sort of branding, um, especially in the software field. If you have a certain graphical interface you're presenting, it, can the design of that uh, be protected, uh, either by copyright or trademark? Uh, maybe in the interest of time, we can just answer one of those questions, and then um, hopefully our panel will be available to stick around for a couple minutes okay, afterwards. The first okay. one especially, yeah. though. Software the software patent enforceability? Uh, I think it, a software patent is just as enforceable as, as another patent. It may run into validity issues when it gets into court. So if you've got a software patent and you haven't done your research up front and the examiner hasn't done his research up front, you may be surprised that, you're, that your opponent that you're trying to stop from <coughs> producing this result uh, will go and do a search. And they can search in a, in a, a German university library to find a thesis project. And that's prior art. So uh, they, can, they can be difficult in that sense. I was just going to say, I've had this conversation with Matt, and I think there's a common misconception about patenting of algorithms, because they say you cannot patent an algorithm. But if you have a good algorithm, you can have a great patent. And I think that's, that's something that Matt, Matt has explained to me. And I think a lot of people think, oh, if it's an algorithm, you can't patent it. Yeah. Uh, but you can patent things that include it or processes that incorporate it and, and provide some practical benefit and then that can end up being a very valuable patent. Thank you. Um, we, we've run a little bit over time so I'd like to ask if the remaining questions perhaps you can um, ask the speakers one-on-one -on -one if they're available to stick around for a couple of minutes. So please join me in thanking Gilbert's LLP and Matthew, Nathaniel and Ashley for a great presentation tonight. Thank you.